Hello. I'm Tariq. I'm making a game called Catacomb Kids, which is a roguelike platformer. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Not Catacomb Kids specifically, although that will play a large part, but roguelike platformers in general. Uh, but first, a little backstory. Uh, Catacomb Kids is a platformer that, as I said, takes very heavy inspiration from the roguelike genre. I ran a Kickstarter for it a few years back, and now it's currently available on Steam and itch.io in early access. I've been told it's pretty neat. Uh, the game has been in development for much longer than I expected by now, but looking at the long development cycles of some other more classic roguelikes makes me feel, if anything, a little more at home than discouraged. Uh, roguelikes seem to be the kinds of games that you could possibly work on forever if there's no one to stop you or you don't starve to death. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit, however, that I haven't always felt at home in this way with roguelikes. I feel like I kind of came to them a little late to the party. Uh, my first roguelike that I can truly claim to have played and enjoyed was Powder RL by Jeff Lake when I was maybe 16 or 17 uh, because it had graphics. Uh, I had tried playing other roguelikes before then, but I didn't really understand what the game, what the genre even was at the time. I'm pretty sure I just looked at them and was like, "What's this is dumb. There's just letters. This is, where's the stuff? Uh, and then closed them and uninstalled them. Uh, but after playing Powder for a while and for sort of familiarizing myself with the basic uh, genre conventions and tropes, I went back and retried some of the ones I had bounced off of earlier and found myself getting really into them, especially uh, Angband and, and uh, Ivan and many of the seven-day roguelikes. And as I did, I learned a lot about myself, uh, the first of which is that I love roguelikes. Uh, they were the kind of game that I had been dreaming of making since before I had ever even heard the term. And then once I found out about them, I realized that a lot of what I had been wanting to do for a very long time had already been done, just without graphics. Uh, the other thing that I learned about myself is that I am very bad at roguelikes. <laughs> I die a lot, just all the time. And I know that's like kind of part of the genre, but you know, I... I uh, <laughs> I can do pretty okay with, with coffee break roguelikes, but when it comes to the classic stuff and the deeper stuff, I'm dead. I make stupid mistakes, I get impatient, I forget about mechanics, I misjudge enemies, it's all bad. But, so here's where the other part of the equation comes into play. Platformers. I love platformers. Unlike roguelikes, platformers are the kinds of games that I grew up with, and they're def kind of defined what my default conception of what a game is. Even now, if you tell me to think of a video game, the first thing that pops into my head is going to be a platformer of some kind. And, uh, except Sonic. I hate Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> and also, unlike roguelikes, I'm pretty decent at platformers. I'm, I'm not like a speedrunner good or anything like that, but I'm good enough. I usually can make it to the end of them. So now we get to the actual thing, the question, the point of this. Uh, why these two? Why combine platformers and roguelikes? Well, for Catacomb Kids, my answer was pretty simple. I wanted to make a roguelike I'd be good at. Since I'm so bad at roguelikes, I wondered how I could go about making one that I could actually play and not suck at. I could just make a normal, traditional roguelike, maybe dumb it down here, ease it up there until I come up with something that I can actually play and win, but that felt disingenuous, presumptuous even to think that I, someone who sucks at roguelikes, could make a good roguelike. Uh, I don't like roguelikes for what they're not, I like them for what they are, it just happens that what they are and what I'm good at don't overlap very much. But if I take platformers, this other thing that I know and love, and make a roguelike within that framework, then I can make something that will properly challenge me with the skill set that I have. Uh, another possible answer to this question is, it's just what we do. As developers, as creative people, as scientists, we take things and mash them together to make something new, to see what happens. Of course, there are things that we evolve on from a single root, but the things that really interest me are these mashups, especially mashups that pull from the same sources because then it becomes a matter of degree. How much of what is pulled from each source? Three parts beat em up, two parts first person shooter. Two parts roguelike, one part platformer. A tablespoon of JRPG. Uh, do you mix the elements lightly so that the bits are still chunky and distinguishable from one another, or do you rapidly whisk it until everything becomes a homogenous froth? Uh, I do think there's one other aspect of this, uh, that, that, uh, which is that the two styles are fundamentally different enough to force uniqueness and innovation when they're combined. It's not like combining a beat-em-up with Zelda-style game, for instance, where the basic interactions roughly map to each other. And it's also not like combining an arena shooter with a roguelike where the similarities of perspective and movement space overlap. Most of the defining aspects of roguelikes and platformers are non-overlapping such that they can coexist. But it's also this no, non-overlapping aspect of the nature that leads me to believe that they can come together and 
in a more interesting way than other genres. So, wait, did I skip something? No. Anyway, this is weird. Uh, I messed up. <laughs> so, this is the dimensions of roguelikeitude. When I look at a roguelike -like game, I tend to try and map just how roguelikey they are. And I know there's already a site that tells you how roguelikey a game is by checking a bunch of boxes and whatnot, but I have my own set of criteria, and we already know that these aren't going to be traditional roguelikes, so that's not really what's in question here. Now, this is just my own personal method of mentally placing non-roguelike games in relation to one another. And the first thing is procedural space. It's gotta be procedural, that's easy. The second thing is once we have our procedural spaces, it matters, of course, what happens within them. Complex situations that emerge as a result of more fundamental rules, in my mind, is one of the strongest hallmarks of roguelikes. They let you get into some wild situations and then get back out again or die trying, which brings us to my next dimension, which is strategic and tactical approaches. And I know there's a difference between those two concepts, but I'm just using them for sh a shorthand for the idea of planning ahead. The idea being, once you get into a situation, how do you get out? This dimension represents not necessarily how much forethought is required by a game, but more how much is possible and how frequently it's encouraged or allowed. This is the ability to have of having the ability to take some time to assess a particular situation and decide what the best course of action is. And lastly, is permanence of consequence. I bet you thought there were only three dimensions, but there's four. <laughs> this one usually manifests itself as permadeath, but I also take it to mean the lasting impact of one's decisions. All those little micro decisions that build up over time to change the trajectory of an entire run. The potential for losing or passing something that you only get one chance at. So these are my four dimensions of roguelikeitude that come to together to define, for me, how roguelike a uh, non-traditional roguelike is. And it's important to note that there are dimensions and not just checkboxes. They aren't just there or not there. They can be sort of there or way there or just a little bit there. As an example is Downwell, which is a fantastic game in which you go down a well. Uh, it has procedurally generated levels, but not really a whole lot in the way of emergent interactions. And while there is a bit of strategy involved in deciding what upgrades to take and what I, what, what upgrades and weapons and to take, that stuff always happens in a safe zone away from any immediate situational context. I wouldn't necessarily call it a roguelike platformer so much as a platformer shoot up, shoot 'em up that has roguelike sort of eh, flavor tinge, just a little tinge, a teaspoon, tablespoon. Uh, but even though you can see that it still has a uh, presence in roguelikeitudinal space. Uh, Catacomb Kids, on the other hand, when compared to Downwell, has much more complex level generation, a heavy focus on emergent gameplay situations, rewards planning ahead, and many of the choices you make have long-lasting consequences, even aside from just dying forever. So that's the setup. That's the, just the reference point for how I think about these things going forward. So now let's look at some actual examples of roguelike platformers. And the first one is something that sticks very close to the origin. Red Rogue is a flash-based game developed by Aaron Steed that is basically just a traditional, tradi basically just a traditional roguelike. Of all the platforms I'm going to talk about, Red Rogue sticks the closest to traditional roguelike gameplay conventions. So you can tell by that statement that it's obviously got procedurally generated levels, permadeath, and dungeon crawling, all that good stuff. But it also has another feature which makes it pretty standard among roguelikes and pretty unique among platformers. Uh, the game is split into two different uh, modes of play, which is, are action RPG and dogmatic. In action RPG, it plays how you would assume a platformer would play. Everything is in real time, regardless of what the player's actions are. If you move or stand still or do whatever, the game just keeps plugging along like normal. In dogmatic mode, however, time only moves forward when the player moves or performs an action. As soon as you stop pressing input, the game stops dead, even the particle effects. As long as the player has control of their character, time does not progress without their consent. And that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? But even more than this, this time dilation, Red Rogue, it's even more than just this time dilation that Red Rogue has in common with traditional roguelikes. The main way you attack enemies is by bumping into them. There is a text scroll at the bottom of the screen that tells you what events are happening around you. Item identification is a very large part of the game. You start out with a skeleton minion that acts a lot like a pet in NetHack or other roguelikes. I mean, heck, there's not even any jumping in the game unless you have a very specific item. And even thematically, the game sets itself up as being directly tied to the original rogue. So the question might be, where is the platformer part of this roguelike platformer? Well, it's got gravity, which is a pretty big giveaway, and it's still a side-scroller, so even though you can't necessarily jump, vertical positioning is immensely important. Rather than jumping over obstacles or onto enemies, you need to take advantage of the numerous ladders and inter interconnected platforms if you want to explore upwards or gain a height advantage over enemies. And 
gaining a height advantage is a real advantage because if you drop down onto enemies from a higher position, it inflicts a long stun on them and lets you follow up with a series of attacks without fear of retribution. And the same applies in reverse though, so you have to be careful not to let enemies get the drop on you. In addition to the verticality, however, horizontal positioning is also an important factor since ranged and thrown weapons can only aim directly to the left and right. Uh, this results in an interesting dynamic where if you want to take advantage of ranged weapons, you need to create horizontal space with your, between you and your foe while still staying on the same level, which conflicts with the strategy of tr always trying to gain the higher ground and drop in on their heads. Like I said, it's mostly a normal roguelike with the twist of being side view, but that one twist and a few others that come about because of it, what might otherwise be a pretty standard roguelike mechanically turns into something fresh and unique. In this way, I think Red Rogue is a good example of how varied the balance of ingredients can be when smashing two things together like this, and of just how little you need of one to add to another to get something interesting and worthwhile. In the same way that I'd say Downwell is a, a platformer with shoot-em-up shoot elements, I'd say that this is a roguelike primarily with some sparse platformer elements. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a very platformer platformer with some roguelike elements. Glorious Spelunky, beloved Spelunky, magnum opus of Derek Yu, at least until Spelunky 2 comes out, which I am very excited about. Uh, but the original was maybe the first platformer to take direct and explicit influence from roguelikes. And if it wasn't, then it was at least uh, the first that mattered. <coughs> With Spelunky, we've suddenly flipped around the ingredients ratio compared to Red Rogue. Uh, Spelunky has a lot more platformer DNA in it. Not only can you actually jump in this one, but the game has an entirely different vibe to it. Uh, the classic Mario and Nintendo influences shine through not only in the player's uh, movement and physics, but in the very visual style itself. It's a t it at times gets very chaotic and frenetic, and it feels like, uh, and it feels very arcadey because it places a heavy uh, focus on your score, which always has a prominent uh, place in the UI. To that end, the game frequently goads you into taking an excess of risk in order to collect more or more valuable treasure. So with Red Rogue, I asked where the platforming was in this mostly roguelike, and now the question is where is the rogueliking in this mostly platformer? Well, you know this already because it's Spelunky and it's been mentioned quite a few times in, this, uh, in other talks, but it's procedurally generated, it's got permadeath. Uh, is that enough to be considered a roguelike platformer? I'm, I'm not sure, maybe. Uh, but if that were all it had borrowed from roguelikes, then it would have been a very different game. Uh, there's one other aspect of roguelikes that Derek Yu uh, mentions lifting for Spelunky in his book about the game. Uh, three points of value from the Berlin interpretation of roguelikes became important principles for guiding the design. Uh, randomized level generation, obviously, permanent death, of course, uh, but also a shared rule set for players, NPCs, and items. And I think that's the important part, and that's the part that really brings it all together. Everything follows the same rules, and this is what allows for the complexity of interactions that makes it feel more li like more than just a platformer and like a roguelike platformer. This is what gives rise to emergence. And as you can see, the three dimensions of roguelikeitude can be mapped directly onto the three uh, aspects of the Berlin interpretation that Spelunky in, uh, employs. Uh, the procedurality of the levels, the consequence of permadeath, and the emergent interactions that arise from the fact that everything is equally subject to the same spike traps and explosions and equally pick upable and throwable. But what about the last dimension? Strategy, tactics, forethought. Well, despite the aforementioned uh, at times chaotic atmosphere and arcadey vibes, Spelunky isn't generally a mindless split second reaction fest unless you intentionally play it that way, like speedrunning or something. Most often, it's beneficial to look over a particular situation before jumping in, and enemy behaviors are both simplistic enough and consistent enough that they can be easily predicted and therefore planned around or taken advantage of. And the same can be said of traps and other environmental hazards. So somewhere between Spelunky and Red Rogue, we have Vagante. Vagante is another a uh, pretty platformer, roguelike platformer, but it's much more grounded in traditional roguelike tropes and atmosphere than Spelunky is. It's much more of a dungeon crawler with a heavier, heavier focus on combat and equipment and carefully picking your way through different level up skills and identifying items. And so is Catacomb Kids. So up until now, we've mostly been looking at how these games relate to traditional roguelikes, but as I mentioned earlier, I think it's also important to look at how they relate to each other. Why are some elements taken and some are left behind? Which ones are adapted, adopted and how do they change in the process? Uh, I think Vagante and Catacomb Kids are an interesting example of this because b both games are setting out with a similar goal of taking a Spelunky-inspired platformer and pulling it back towards the roguelike dungeon crawler side of the equation. And in doing so, both games borrow many of the same elements and mechanics, but to wildly different effect. 
It becomes less about the proportion of each stuff, of stuff each game borrows from roguelikes and more about which things they borrow specifically and the differences in application which the, when the same uh, mechanics are used. Uh, in Vigante, you pick from three different classes and each has their own unique skills to level up and different starting equipment and stats. The combat is reactive and evasive and each weapon type has a different behavior, but the weapons and armors themselves are randomly generated with any number of different properties. The atmosphere is dark and it uses a roguelike style fog of war that gradually reveals the level as you explore. Potions and other items are unidentified until you drink them or use a scroll to identify their properties and you find spell books to learn spells from. In Catacomb Kids, you pick from four classes, and each has their own unique skills to level up and different starting equipment and stats. Uh, the combat is reactive and evasive, and each weapon type has a different behavior, but the weapons and armors themselves are randomly generated with any number of different properties. The atmosphere is dark, and it uses roguelike style fog of war that gradually reveals the level as you explore. Potions are unidentified until you drink them or throw them at enemies to identify their properties, and you use spell books to learn spells from. This sound very similar. Uh, but for all their apparent similarities, however, each game becomes immediately apparent that they've got different souls if you play them. Uh, and each of the aforementioned roguelike mechanics is handled in a completely different way. Uh, Vagante's classes are classic fantasy-style classes and RPG roles, the knight, the rogue, and the mage. And the class system was mechanically inspired in part by Diablo. Catacomb Kids' classes, on the other hand, I kind of just made up uh, their... I made them up after the fact to justify the stats, and uh, they define uh, the rules by which your characters are generated rather than guaranteeing a specific set of starting conditions. Uh, Vigante's combat is reactive and evasive because of enemy behavior that demands attention and caution, but otherwise it sticks fairly close to Spelunky in terms of the timing and monodirectionality of attacks. Catacomb Kid's combat is reactive and evasive because the player's own moveset encourages mobility, and the combat was heavily inspired by Smash Brothers games, from which I lifted both attack directionality and the dodge maneuver, which play a very big role. And even the way we approach our primary influences is different, with, uh, which ripples throughout the rest of the game. Uh, Nuke Nine, the developers of Vagante, cite Spelunky and Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup as the two major influences of the game, with Spelunky providing the basis for the platforming, while Dungeon Crawl uh, inspired a system of gods and shrines and branching levels. On the other hand, I didn't really have a specific roguelike in mind when working on Catacomb Kids, more just the general idea that I wanted a game like Spelunky, but more roguelike. I ended up taking bits and pieces from whatever I felt like at the time. Uh, and aside from just the shared foundation of Spelunky plus roguelike, each game has numerous different inspirations f beyond those for mood and atmosphere, world building and pacing, that all build upon each other and send them down very different paths. Uh, so we've looked at uh, some specific games and their relationships with roguelikes and with each other, but what about specific roguelike mechanics and how are they adapted to uh, different roguelike platformers? So let's look beyond the broad strokes now and dig into the details of how certain mechanics have been applied to roguelike platformers, starting with darkness and vision. Uh, in traditional roguelikes, the player's ability to see threats around them is often a large part of the game's strategic qualities and is usually represented by a combination of line of sight, fog of war, and the actual radius outwards your vision extends. Of these three, line of sight is the one that's nearly universal in traditional roguelikes that seems to be much less common in uh, roguelike platformers. And even so, many platformers do uh, try to, if not copy the mechanics directly, at least approximate them. As I mentioned, Catacomb Kids and Vigante are all, uh, both use the roguelike style Fog of War and uh, the game Red Rogue and Crystal Catacombs also uh, have darkness as, as mechanics. Uh, but only Red Rogue actually employs line of sight. Uh, I tried implementing line of sight in Catacomb Kids a long time ago, but I wasn't really smart enough at the time to code it efficiently enough to run in real time. Uh, I could probably do it now, but by now the game is designed without that in mind. Many other platformer roguelikes like Spelunky, Cave Blazers, and Tower Climb tend to largely ignore this aspect of roguelikes unless it's used to mark a special situation, as is the case in Spelunky's occasional dark floors. Uh, even despite its sporadic usage in roguelike platformers, the mechanic of light and visibility is still worth exploring, I think, uh, as shown by Roguelite by Daniel Linson, a.k.a. Manigore, a.k.a. he makes amazing games. Uh, in Roguelite, the player character has no visibility range herself and is instead entirely dependent on environmental light sources to navigate erratically generated levels full of spike traps and hooded cultist enemies and flying skeletons. <clears throat> 
You have to make use of your limited number of flaming arrows to both light the way ahead and to defeat enemies, which makes for a pretty interesting trade-off in game of resource management. Uh, another mechanic that's commonly found in roguelikes but that's similar, similarly infrequent in platformer roguelikes is the hunger clock. In traditional roguelikes, the threat of starvation acts as a way to enforce e efficiency and resource management and to discourage just waiting around somewhere whenever you get a boo-boo in games that have health and mana, re man mana regeneration. Uh, in real-time games, this ends up just translating to time pressure. Uh, some games, like Spelunky and Crystal Catacombs, uh, take this time pressure and keep it and use it. Uh, the ghost in Spelunky that appears after five minutes serves to keep the player from just cleaning house on every floor and grabbing every last piece of treasure uncontested, and also to force players to act if they're taking too long and mulling over a situation to keep the arcadey pace. In Crystal Catacombs, levels are generated in a fairly straightforward way such that the timer doesn't become onerous or overly punishing unless the players are exceedingly slow. However, the hunger clock might be a little harder to fit into a slower paced game or one with larger, more complex levels. And I know this because I spent a few days trying to put one in Catacomb Kids and it was a terrible, terrible fit for the game. Eating corpses, eating enemy corpses has always been one of those weird, quirky mechanics that seemed very specific to, to roguelikes, and so when I made Catacomb Kids, it was obviously one of the first things I stole. Uh, for a long time, though, it was just a way to restore health and didn't feel very interesting within the larger context of the game. I had never actually added the starvation component to eating things because I was just so bemused by the idea that you could kill anything and just eat it right there. I kind of just stopped after that. Uh, so later on, when I like, took a good look at the mechanic and realized that aside from the thematic absurdity, it was just kind of mechanically boring, it seemed like the natural thing to do would be to take the other half of the mechanic I had already stolen and add starvation and a need to eat. But it sucked and it was bad. Uh, it ruined the pace of the game uh, to have this time pressure where I was trying to encourage thoughtfulness and caution because being thoughtful, thoughtful and cautious was then punished. It also ruined the possibility of ever doing a pacifist run because you had to kill things just to eat them and stay alive, and I don't want to force people to ever have to fight anything if they can avoid it. So I killed that real quick. However, the experiment did end up leading to the food cue mechanic in the game, which is, I think, one of the few original ideas that I have in the game uh, that wasn't stolen from somewhere else. Uh, with the food queue, every five items you eat will grant you some kind of bonus. Uh, just eating a random mix of, of things, corpses, bats, rats, uh, uh, grumbles, which are the, the uh, goblin-type enemies in the game, just eating randomly will generally result in a small heal or some, the restoration of some spell charges. But if you're more picky about what you eat and eat certain things in a certain order, then the bonuses can become more powerful and unique. For example, eating a meal of five grumbles gives you the meal effect called butcher, which means that all, he all healing to you is reduced to just restoring, just restoring one or two HP. But on the other hand, every corpse or piece of meat that you eat heals you for extra. And this change to the way food work ended up encouraging people to eat specific things and try different combinations of food, but it didn't punish them for not engaging with the system, so it doesn't distract from the rest of the game. Uh, another aspect of roguelikes that is adopted to uh, platformers is more frequently is uh, some sort of inventory or equipment management. Uh, it seems to be universally present aspect of most roguelike platformers, although this might just be attributable to them being more RPG-like games in the first place. Uh, and to that effect, many of the games feature fairly straightforward RPG-style inventories where the items you pick up are either represented as a list of menu options or on a grid. Uh, neither Vagante nor Cave Blazers, however, uh, pause the game while you're looking at your inventory, so equipping weapons and armor while looking through your backpack for healing items can be risky in a combat situation if you aren't paying attention to your surroundings. Uh, there are also less conventional ways of handling inventory, however, such as in Spelunky, where most items can be categorized as either accessories or carryable objects. Uh, carryable objects include most of the objects in the world, enemy corpses, uh, weapons, uh, and the player can only carry one such thing at a time. They need to drop it and p if they want to pick something else up. Accessories, on the other hand, grant passive benefits, and once you pick them up, there's generally no way to lose them except through special circumstances, which means there's no inventory management or menus or anything to slow down the game or take you out of the game space. And this is something that I really am admired about Spelunky. So with Catacomb Kids, I borrowed this idea of minimal inventory management, but decided to interpret it more as a no hammer space rule for the game. Anything that you're carrying has to actually be present on your person. You don't get a nebulous void space within which to tuck away a, like a dozen swords. 
Uh, instead, you have five equipment spots, your head, your body, your weapon, your offhand, and your shoes. And anything that isn't equipped to one of those slots is either in your hand, in your pocket, which is large enough for one small item, or lying on the floor of the dungeon somewhere. Uh, another thing that's a, a feature of a lot of roguelikes is gods and shrines. And they're one of those aspects of traditional, as, traditional roguelikes that you might think would be more niche and less applicable to other games than, say, line of sight, but they're surprisingly common in roguelike platformers. Granted, they're usually pared down to just a single nebulous god rather than having a full pantheon, but shrines where players can pray or sacrifice items, creatures, or health for a powerful boon to an unseen deity have managed to find their way into games as diverse as Spelunky, Cave Blazers, Vagante, Vagante uh, Red Rogue, Rogue Legacy, and eventually there will be a way to interact with the god that exists in the Catacomb Kids world as well. Uh, of all these, however, only Vagante keeps the idea of a pantheon of gods with differing personalities, desires, and rewards, as mentioned earlier, inspired by Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. And even though these gods are also simplified from what traditional roguelikes have to offer and what the devs actually set out to turn them into, Vagante manages to maintain a sense of a world with a living and fickle gods. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, I guess, because this talk is already pretty freaking long and I could keep going on and on and on and on. Um, but yeah, those, that's, those are my thoughts about roguelike platformers, and I like them a lot, and I hope you like them too. Feeding back earlier. Oh, now it's on. Great. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, I have a question as well, which I'm going to ask okay. as I walk over there, which is one clear thing that's different between platformers and roguelikes is how you view the map. And one thing that you do a lot in roguelikes is traversing large amounts of the map and large amounts of space really quickly because it's like super simple and you can sort of programmatically do it, which is not something you can do in a platformer because traversing a platformer is sort of the fun of the game. Um, how do you deal with that tension, that design tension? Have you thought about how it applies to platformers? I've, I've noticed that I feel like a lot of uh, roguelike platformers, pro possibly for that exact reason, uh, tend to have much uh, smaller level spaces than traditional roguelikes. They aren't as sprawling. And uh, they're, so they're much more compact, and within that, that space, are, they try to fit a lot of uh, interesting things and interesting interactions. I know, personally, I, I, I do use much smaller uh, levels, but even so, I feel like part of that sense of, of getting lost can also be a uh, big part of the appeal of roguelikes and where you're exploring this vast space, you don't know what's around the next corner or like where you have to go. Like that sensation isn't necessarily something to be avoided. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, how do you generate your maps? I gave a GTC talk about that a few years ago. It's online, you can watch it. It's, uh, but as a general overview, I uh, sort of, I have the, I use a sort of a system of rooms that, uh, that are connected. So I generate a grid of rooms, and uh, I can like define their dimensions and that sort of thing. And then I uh, shift them around so that they're not aligned to the grid anymore. And then I uh, connect them via tunnels and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then uh, when, once they're all connected and everything is like looking pretty, I uh, define certain rooms to be pre-made. Uh, which are very similar to the uh, Spelunky's sort of uh, grid system where I can define certain tiles to have a probabilistic chance of appearing or not appearing and that sort of thing. And certain rooms are pre-made in that way where they, they like load a template from a text file and just use that. Uh, but those are, th those are also mixed in with other rooms that are entirely random. Uh, so yeah, but if you want to watch that GDC talk, that, uh, that would probably help a lot more. I don't have slides for ready for that. So I I'm, I really like Spelunky and Tower Climb, but I couldn't get into, for example, Cave Blazers because I thought the combat was super clunky. How do you, as a dev, choose uh, what elements of certain games you want to take inspiration from, and what do you like cut out, or like where do you draw the line? I mean, honestly, it's just a matter of personal preference. I love Spelunky, but 
the combat, I found the combat like too straightforward. Like it's just, oh, you hit the thing, and it's just, it's, you only have one attack. Whereas me, I am really, really into like different combat systems and especially as I mentioned Smash Brothers. And so that was one of the things that I, that was a huge inspiration for me for the combat of the game. And I, I don't know, it's just whatever inspires you. Like it, for me, I look at something and I'm like, oh, that looks rad and then I'll steal it. And then sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, uh, people will yell at me, uh, or I will yell at myself. Or as with the as with the case with the hunger mechanic, it's it's obvious when it's not working out. Uh, but I, I don't really think there's a problem with trying something and then finding out it doesn't work or that it's not quite your speed. But I feel like you generally have an idea of what what your uh, preferences are, and will those will sort of guide you to something that will be enjoyable for you. Anyone else? I'm going to ask one more question because right. I have the mic. <laughs> um, uh, in your talk, you talked about lots of different aspects of specific roguelikes in the Berlin interpretation, but you sort of just waved your hands over what a platformer is. To you, what are canonical platformers? When you think platformer, what is it that is uh, inspiring Catacomb Kids? That is a fantastic question. Oh, man. There's so many. There's so many. I don't, so I like Kirby. I like all the like, Nintendo platformers, Mario, Kirby, uh, Zelda 2, surprisingly. Um, there's, um, there was a SNES platformer, I don't remember what it was called, but you like played as a bard and you like played musical notes to kill enemies. It was weird, I don't know. I played like a lot, like I didn't have an SNES as a kid, but I pirated literally everything. And so I played basically like all the platformers on that. So like that just entire uh, uh, library is like what is in my head. So like I, like I said earlier, if you tell me to think of a video game, something that will pop into my head will be a platformer, but it won't be like a specific platformer. It will be like an amalgamation of all of those platformers. Uh, also inspir inspirational are uh, sort of the animation-based platformers like Prince of Persia and uh, Heart of Darkness and um, Flashback, all those stuff. Anyway, I could, yeah, I like, pla I like, like platformers. They're all good. I like them. Heart of Darkness is an amazing game. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh.